welcome to Youthquake. Um, I'm your moderator. I'm the moderator. Yeah. I am Dr. Ru. Uh, feel free to call me that. I am the director of development mm. with the Freedom and Prosperity Center at the Atlantic Council. And yeah, here today. Uh, it's so good to be back again, you know. <laughs> My name is Luol Mayen. Uh, I'm a CEO and uh, founder of Genoob Game. Genoob uh, Game is a video game company that we focus a lot on building game for peace and conflict resolution. So I'm really excited to, you know, to join the panel and you know, have a conversation. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Musa, Musa Konra. I'm the uh, executive director of uh, Sahel Institute, uh, a nonprofit based in, uh, in Bamako, Mali. We have office in uh, work in the Sahel regions, uh, work in the intersection of uh, democracy, uh, digital literacy, digital inclusion, and also governance. So we work a lot with the, with the youth uh, platforms and also youth participation and engagement in uh, civic society and things. Thank you. Thank you so much. What I really liked about this topic when it was given to me was it's going to be called Youthquake. And <laughs> we're going to shake some things up on this stage. So I hope you're ready. And I hope you're ready with the questions as well, because we have a lot to talk about, about the role of young people um, in transforming Africa. And when I was just looking at the definition of youthquake, I saw that it means a significant cultural, political, or social change arising from the actions and influence of young people. And what a befitting topic, uh, especially if we're discussing the youngest thriving economy um, and continent where, I mean, if we're going to be discussing prosperity, if we're going to be discussing uh, political transformation, if we're going to be discussing innovation technologically. So those are the things that we're going to be talking about today. So I will start with you, uh, Musa. What do you think are the key ways in which the next generation of Africans are uniquely well positioned to shape the future of their continent or the world. Thank you so much uh, for this question and also uh, the organizer for this panel because whatever we design today or we're doing today, we're doing for the next generation. For sure the next 100 years or 50 years, some of us may be still among them but not active as we are today. Uh, when you take the African um, Agenda 2063, uh, mm -hmm. you will see there is a lot of component concerning youth participation and youth engagement. Mm -hmm. And um, also the agenda for other organizations focusing on, uh, on the youth participation, mm -hmm. on the youth and the future of our uh, continent and also our planet. But the most challenging thing, some of these organizations are not taking time to include the youth in the conversation. Because whatever we design, if the ones we're designing for are not part of the conversation, mm -hmm. for sure, whatever we design today for them, they may not fit in this. And for me, this has been one of the biggest challenges in the continent. Because uh, the majority of the population, as you, you've seen, the youth represent the majority in the population in the continent and growing, uh, they, the, the figures will sh show us. The youth not been part of the conversation a lot. And when you see also, we talked this morning about the digitalization and also the economy we've seen today, five years ago, mm -hmm. maybe we didn't, we were not talking about this. The community manager, the ones who are making a lot of money from the job we're doing today with the digitalization, the technology tools, they were not today. So what will be the next feature, the next economy? Mm -hmm. And how to get involved our young people in this conversation? So first of all, the way we design project solutions, we must be sure this population are part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. We can hear from them. Sometimes uh, we can see or understand the problems today, mm -hmm. but the, the next solution, the next things we're going, they have to be part of this conversation. It could be a economic inclusion, it could be a governance conversation, it could be political uh, solution design, so they have to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you because I know before when we're planning for this session, we had a session, a pre-session, and sure. we spoke about a lot of things that I think will be interesting um, to, the, to the guests. But 
I just learned in the last few minutes that there is power in telling our own stories as Africans. Mm. And I know you have such a powerful story on how you are changing um, the world, our world, using uh, digitalization, through digital, digitalization. Would you like to share um, with the public the work that you're doing and the role that the young people are playing in digitalization, please? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think that uh, when you look at Africa itself, like the population is so young, young people. For example, I'm from South Sudan, whereby almost 73% of the population are under the age of 30. And, and when you look at the, the economic development of, 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 of the country, it's pretty down. And I think that you know, the most important thing when you look at youth themselves, you know, I always tell people that you know, we can use our own experiences and our past to be able to create a sustainable future for other people. And I think that when we, when we include young people in terms of like, uh, creating their own solution, and then that is, that's when the, the development comes, that's when the innovation comes, and that's when we, we are able to build products. And uh, I remember, you know, when I was growing up in a refugee camp, I did not just, you know, I started making video games, you know. I had, I had to use my own experience and as, as a person. And for example, the game that I'm developing, it's a game that is helping people to understand what refugees go through. And, and when you look at that, it's not just Africa itself. It, it, it's, it's development, it's uh, innovation. It's also like, how do we bring experiences, also the culture, you know, and, and in, in, the, in, in, in the world of development and also in the world of technology. And I think that youth are very, very powerful when it comes to like, what does it mean to be able to create our own things? What does it mean for us to, you know, to be able to, to own our own narrative, our own stories? And I, and I think and that's why it's really very important to be able to invest in, in youth and uh, in the continent, yeah. And as a young person um, in America, mm -hmm from South Sudan, who has had barriers of um, sometimes even language or mm -hmm. um, presence. I'm speaking from experience. Yeah. I am mm -hmm. from Zimbabwe. I remember the first time I came to America, I would not communicate for five minutes without being um, feeling like I was crushed because somebody would say, huh, 20 yeah. times. And those are the barriers that I have had to face and navigate through. And now I'm working with the most amazing think tank um, in the world. And I know there's so many uh, barriers that you've had to face as a young person. What have you had to lean on for strength and support to still be able to tell your story and st to still inspire the world, uh, Lua? And I think, you know, I think the most important thing is when we are growing maybe in business or anything that we do. As young people, I think the most important thing is the support system. You know, when I, when I grew up in, in Uganda, I did not have access to better quality education because I was living in a refugee camp. Mm. So I had to navigate a way that how do I change that, that particular situation? We have more than 70 million refugees around the world. Some of them do not have access to education. And I think that being able to understand that the only way I could change my life and could, could be able to like bring something to the world that people can be able to use it is through education. And I think that those, those movements were able to like help me to understand, okay, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? You know, what does it mean to, I came to the US five years ago, you know, and I've been here for like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm building a product and being able to like have a market for it and being able to see like, what does it mean for me to give back to my community? And I think that, that's the most important thing, and, and, and I was able to learn a lot, you know, to be able to, like, work on my game and so on, yeah. Mm, thank you. Okay. Mm. Musa Luol spoke about a support system. Mm. Um, we are here on this panel because there is a support system, and that support system is probably sometimes through organizations like DI, uh, Atlantic Council, and that, that just make it possible for these conversations to happen so that people can tell our stories. I remember when we were speaking, uh, preparing for this session, we spoke about the importance of acknowledging the role that um, the developing world plays in propelling uh, either prosperity or, or development in the developing world. What are your experiences or what 
what is your point of view in terms of uh, the role of the developing world in, in supporting, um, uh, the role of the developed world in supporting the developing world? Uh, thank you so much. This is a really important question because sometimes we found the ones who have the possibility to make things happen are not the ones who know the problems. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and my part of the world in Mali, where I'm from and what I'm based at actually, sometimes donor or organization even oblige organization to go to a lines they want them to go, even though this is not the way to solve the problem. So it is a time, it is a waste of time for us as we are solving our problems. It is a spending of money without solving the problem and also make other people lose their time because they will see it like the problem will say, the pro for example, the program is uh, about five years or uh, until five years we think is at the end of the five years we realize, oh, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. What do we do? So we design another solution from Brussels, from Washington, from Paris, and start again and it again. And what you said, my first experience uh, is from Francophone Africa, and also this is another leg of problems because Francophone Africa has been out of conversation for like years, and we even not access to the platforms. And the second uh, thing I want to add to this is the facility for the youth in the continent to move around. How, wh what is the chance for uh, a young man from Mali or from Burkina Faso to be in this platform today. It's kind of impossible for him. Even though he's invited because he's talented, he's bringing the right solution, he may not just get the visa. Mm -hmm. Simple, as easy as simple. So just bringing, I've been here through a program uh, through the State Department initiated by uh, President Obama back in the days, what we call Young African Leaders Initiative. Mm -hmm. I've been selected and, and, and attended a fabulous program in the Dartmouth College, which permitted me to be here and improve my English, uh, being in an institution and also organize. But right after that, I returned back home to invest in, uh, in development and also make things happen in the country. So that's why I can easily be a bridge between these English speaking uh, initiatives and also what's happening back home and how we can shift the conversation and the narrative say, okay, you may have their money, you may have uh, a great, well-organized organization, but this is our context. I, we know our problems, and, we, and, and bringing solutions from outside, it may work in certain cases, mm -hmm. but in very areas in the continent, and specifically in Mali, even the way you shake hands of an imam or you shake hands of a, a community leader, you fail, because whatever you bring, he will just listen to you, but he will not do it, mm -hmm. because this first contact show you disrespect him. So these are certain small things people sometimes need to understand mm -hmm. and also be part of the global solution. Mm -hmm. And as you said, obeying youth is not a skill, it's a trend of age. Mm -hmm. And this trend of age can be used by whoever is on the ground. If they, they, the world organized crime organization want to use this youth power, mm -hmm. they will use it. But how we can do as civil society organization and other platforms as uh, we are having here, mm -hmm. like early, I had this conversation with my fellows from uh, uh, Zimbabwe earlier. I say, it's so good and great, like we are having this conversation about the future of Africa here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. But how we take advantage from this and getting back this in the continent from wherever we are, the network we build from this, mm -hmm. and ex inspire from each other's experience from each other's country mm -hmm. and make things happen. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, maybe before I come back to Luol, I know you've worked with some very, in some interesting offices in Mali and doing some amazing work where politics and governance is concerned. What is the role of young people that you, that you see right now? Or what is the role of young people, especially in uh, organizing, um, towards good governance, towards great political leadership, and towards hopefully prosperous economies. What is the role of, role of young people, not just in Mali, but also looking at all the countries that you've worked with? Thanks so much. Uh, I, what I've said the first is, we have a long time get out young people of the conversation. 
the national and the global conversation. And because of what? They have not been at school. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to read or write. Mm -hmm. And which language? French or English? That's the point. And it doesn't mean they don't understand. It doesn't mean they are idiots. Excuse me for the mm -hmm. time. Because this is the exactly, when I say the being young or the youth is not a skill, is a trend of age. When I say this is uh, energy, is a creativity, is um, leadership, is taking initiative, is a power, is activity. So if the right reason uh, doesn't use these young people, the wrong reasons will use them. And in Mali and in Sahel region, this is what's happening. For a longer time, the democratization of the country, the conversation was really elitist. Mm -hmm. And people think this is now you understand, like in the big cities, you understand you are part of it. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the people he said about uh, his country in Mali is, is, is almost the same. The majority of people have not been a part of the conversation. And now, these are what the others are using against the, democ the democracy. Mm. And say democracy in Mali, just to give you a short context, we had like six military coup in the region in the past three years, right? Mm. So how these military regimes are having rooted because they are having conversation to people who are understanding their language, even though it's not predictive for the country in the longer term. Mm -hmm. And also we have a shift of partners where we have a lot of Russians coming in the game, in the conversation, and they bring with expert on populism, on propaganda, on disinformation, and this disinformation is designed for these young people. So that means they receive, when all the conversation is built around what French felt doing in Mali and what they are proposing to solve as a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So for me, in, in economy inclusion and also participation in everything is how we reach to them. Even though they don't, they don't speak, this is one of the things we are doing in the Sahel Institute. We design program in local languages so we can get to them, not just on digital space, but also in physical space. So we can have like direct conversation, not only in big cities, but also down in the countries, like inside the countries, mm -hmm. where you have people who have never been at school, they don't know how to write or read, but they are very active on WhatsApp, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have created what we call WhatsApp radios, mm -hmm. where all the messages are vocal, vocal format, and then in the language they speak. So the message is, uh, is, uh, is made in the, the language to combat first disinformation, because the disinformation is designed for these people and they will not use the same route as mm. the checked information. Mm. So we have to create our own route to disseminate verified information so people have access to other information, not just the ones who are designed for them to fool and also to make them believe this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Luol, um, you mentioned that you use technology Mm -hmm. as a form of um, addressing conflict resolution. And I did not hear you um, voice that out a lot. What are the other innovations that you can talk about that are available for young people, not only in the um, conflict, uh, mm -hmm. in the conflict resolution space, but also maybe in other areas? What are those? innovations that are available for young people, especially now that they can take um, a chance on and shake things up in the world and make the world a better place, just like you've done. Yeah, I think technology is uh, it's a very great tool that we can use for anything. We can use it for like, you know, it's a great medium we can use to change perspective. We can use it to change the mindset of young people. I think that the most important thing is when you look at Africa and the young people, I think we live in, we, we are in a space whereby youth are not giving the opportunity to become independent. And, and, and but who should give them that opportunity? The, uh, it, it's, it's the people. The people need to give them the, the opportunities like education, you know, giving them the resources. Like you asked before, like what can we do as, uh, as young people that are here in the diaspora or here in, in the U.S. that have opportunities? And the most important thing is collaboration, being able to see like what do we do in order to like collaborate with different companies. For example, I remember like, 
during the pandemic, I, you know, I started working from home. You know, and, and, and the reason is because if I was somewhere in Africa and I do not have access to technology, I do not have access to like maybe computers, then I will not have, I will not have the opportunity to even work from home. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because when we're able to empower youth to become independent in terms of education, we, and that's why like, I started my own foundation, and then in order to like collaborate with different tech companies that are in the US, also in the video game industry. So because of that, we are able to like empower you know, young people in order to become independent in terms of like some of them can become their own entrepreneurs, some of them can you know, create their own companies. And the reason is because when they have that opportunity to become independent, second is that like when it comes to decision making, it becomes much easier for them. Some of them may not join you know, the armed forces in terms of like conflict, some of them may not end up in prison and stuff like that because that's a reason of empowerment and that's a reason why it's really very important for us to actually like empower young people. And when you look at the new generation, everybody use like technology right now. You know, some of them can start their own medium in terms of like writing blogs about, you know, for example, South Sudan, what is going on? Some of them can talk about traveling, what is going on? The reason is because we are actually using that content in order like to, to change the perspective about what is going on in the, in the continent. So I think that technology is really very important in, in, in helping young people and shape them. Thank you. I'm looking around um, this room and I see a lot mm. of uh, people that some are mentors, some have mentored mm. other people. And mm. I would like to believe that all of us are products of great mentorship. What role do you think mentorship plays, um, especially in helping young people to translate that passion, that zeal, that they have um, into something that's more uh, productive because you spoke about the coups. Uh, we experienced one in Zimbabwe and I know you experienced one and there are so many coups that are happening all over the world and you see young people um, at the forefront of every coup. How do you think we can lean on the wisdom of the people that have gone before us, whether it's in politics, in governance, in business, to translate that energy that we have as younger people into something more productive and actually build the continent? Oh, so um, I would say Failing in this has been one of the reasons we are having so much coups in the continent today. Okay. Why? Because the beautifully we painted democracy in a Western world is completely the opposite of democracy in our regions. Because we are not walking the talk. The Democrat and elected government are sometimes the most corrupt openly in front of everyone is the short cause to become billionaires in a mandate. Mm. And nothing happens. And what is worse is the way some very developed democracies and well-known as democracy, pioneering of democracy, model of democracy, is backing certain regions in our areas, based on their own interests. For example, when the coup happened in Mali, and the same time could happen in other countries in Africa. I'm, I would not name, you know, but it's clear the role the French government plays among these coup militaries. The president of France himself, Macron, moved himself to go in certain country, attend the, the swearing of a military after the coup. And the same moment, the same French is condemning openly the other coups, even though they are legitimate. Because legal and legitimacy are two things different. We had corrupt regimes legally elected, but with any of legitimacy. And we had the military regimes illegally in position but supported by the population. So what happened? Mm -hmm. We should ask ourselves these questions. First, secondly, we have designed also the anti, um, the change 
of power, not just by military, but the civilians we consider as politicians who decided to change their own constitution in order to do the third terms. And the same model of democracy continue to support them. So what kind of the message you are sending to these young people who are not going through 100 paths to understand? They will just see USA is red here, and you say is white here, and we're talking about the same democracy, and the elected ones are not solving our problems. Because for me, one of the first thing in democracy is being able to solve current problems and anticipate in future challenges. Mm -hmm. If a government cannot provide this, that means you're not here for your people. So when this happens, mm -hmm. we see it in Mali, the case of Mali, we've been in the street, a civil society organization, all the coalition for six months protesting against corruption, against everything. No one heard nothing. And when the coup happens, everyone jumps in the game. No coup, no coup, no coup. No coup, and then what? So showing mentoring, I will say, mentorship is, is very important. Mm -hmm. In politics, in everyday life, mm -hmm. in our own families, mm -hmm. the way we do this, the kids look at us, mm -hmm. our communities. And for me, the relationship between the, demo, the strong democracy countries like the US or European or Western countries, it should not just be funding the, the, the economy of these countries, mm -hmm. but how to be sure we have values. And these values are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we go through this or we don't go through this. But we cannot be selective in terms of, you can do this, we close our eyes because you are our friends, you are doing this, mm -hmm. and you, you cannot do this. Mm -hmm. And now the, he talked about the digitalization. The, the world is kind of global village, and the, all the narrative of these propagandists were built on this fact. And when you bring it, it's true. So now, what we can do moving forward is to be really constructive on what we say. Mm -hmm. Democracy, we have rules, mm -hmm. we have values. Because what people don't pay attention is like authoritarian countries are founding and supporting these military regimes. Mm -hmm. Because every single country which arrives to get out of democracy system is like added value to their system. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of now the survival of democracy itself. Mm -hmm. And recently, last September, when I heard the president of Guinea speaking in a, in a, in a United Nations tribune, we just realized this is the only place remaining in the world where we can be free speech. Mm -hmm. Because even as a own country, if a, a opposition leader or journalist or whoever talk to this, talk this way to him, for sure he would sleep in the prison. Mm -hmm. But he was able to come and speak this, his mind, in the United Nations for free and go back home. So this is the thing we do. Otherwise, we decide to do it, mm -hmm. or we improve the way we're doing and we do it. Otherwise, we don't have a choice. I like what you're saying, um, but I've always wondered if there is, a, if young people, especially in Africa have mastered the art of speaking truth to power while still being respectful and still achieving um, the goal or the mission that we uh, they'll be having. For instance, if we want to move our economies forward, if we want to move education forward, how are we actually, what, have you, what are the ways that you've communicated truth to power and help transform the face of young people um, in your community? I mean, you know, the most important thing, you know, for the youth is to be able to understand the label of our, of the, of, of, of the thing that they can be able to develop, mm -hmm. you know. And I, when I was talking before in terms of, like, what does it mean? Because you cannot be what you can see, mm -hmm. you know. Like, and the most important thing is, like, when you look, when you look at the youth in, in Africa, I think we need to, like, empower them in order to be able, for example, you talk about mentorship. Mm -hmm. I think, like, when I started my own company, mm -hmm. you know, I, I needed people around me in order to be able like, to share me to, to, and understand things. For example, it's not just being a video game designer. It's also like, how is it like to be able to run a company? How is it like to be able to like, bring the right people around you in order for you to, to succeed? And I think that for the youth, the most important thing is to have that path and be able to like, have those resources in order to like, help themselves and be able to like, bring things that we can be able to do. And, I, and I, I think that's the most important thing, yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, what are the opportunities that are there today um, for a young person that might be watching from uh, Djibouti right now mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are listening to you, they are feeling your passion. What would you say are the opportunities available for any young person today where organizing themselves is concerned towards a more prosperous um, continent, towards a more prosperous economy? Um, are there any opportunities like that? Uh, first of all, to always believe in themselves, mm -hmm. to be resilient. Because I, I take always myself with a lot of humility to talk about this. And you mentioned the mentorship. The conversation always happened back home like, oh, you are advising us to do this, to do that, based in Washington or based in Paris. So how do you ex asking us to be resilient back home? That's been one of the reasons when I finished the programs here, I returned back home. Now you cannot say, oh, Musa, you're there, or you. So it's easy to have this conversation open. Now we are all here. What we can do to move forward first. Secondly, my parents are about 500 kilometers from Bamako, like a very, very small town. Mm -hmm. I thank God they're all doing well. Thanks God. I tell them, what was the change of a young man from a Francophone Africa, from inside 500 kilometers in Bamako, have a barbecue with Obama and his wife? Mm -hmm. What is the change for you? Zero. Zero? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got this chance to make this happen in Chicago, mm. 2018. Mm. So just to tell you a little bit, you can even dream, like dream big, like dream until you lost. Never think this could happen, but you made it happen. Mm -hmm. Just trust the process. There is no shortcut. Mm. The young people, whatever they are, whatever they're doing, they must be honest to themselves. They must work with integrity and not shortcuts. Mm -hmm. We never know. Today, I've been learning a lot from, from Luyo today. Mm -hmm. So what is the chance we collaborate from his opportunity and what's happening in West Africa? The young men I know in video games business is 100%, because I'm, touch, I'm in touch with him. I've, I'm already following him on all the platforms. <laughs> <laughs> right? So maybe starting their home, video gaming in Mali, Francophone, what is the change for them to, to, to get to the level? But now, I can be the bridge. I don't know much about this. Mm -hmm. But knowing him directly, and I'm sure you will be available to even talk with these young people, to tell them, this is the way to go. You should do this. You should do that. And et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Earlier when I arrived, I've seen the painting in the wall. I just asked the lady, uh, she's lovely. And I asked her, Akela, why you don't have Malian artists here? And she said, um, these are people I work directly during the time. So I say, give me your card. I have to get in touch with, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. For me, this is the way it happens. Because I know a very talented, some very talented young man in this business in Mali. Mm -hmm. So wow, why? So imagine if they just got dis discouraged because nothing happening. Mm. You will not see tomorrow. So resilience, hard work, and never give up. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, You've got something to say? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like that's 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 really fantastic. I think for me is that you know there's a lot of resources that um, young people can be able to use. You know, the most important. I remember like the most important thing is being content with what you have. Mm -hmm. For example, you might live somewhere in Africa where you don't have access to a lot of resources. But the most important thing is like, make sure you believe in yourself and not make sure that what you're doing is something that you love. Because there's going to be a lot of challenges in order for you to achieve what you want. So for example, when I was in a refugee camp, I had to work almost three hours every day to go and charge my computer. But the reason is, the reason is because I want to utilize that. And today, I have a video game company. I never thought in a refugee camp I would be able to like, have my own video game in a refugee camp. Second to that, I never thought like I would be in the industry. And I think the most important thing is like, pick up your computer, learn. You know, you, you can be a self-taught. You can be, be able to do anything. And I think that's the most important thing. 
and being able to like do and create product that, that can be able to like change the world. And I think that's the most important. The young people, we should never think that people, people are, we, we, we cannot succeed without people. Mm -hmm. We cannot succeed without the government. No, the most important thing is like educate yourself and be able to like help yourself and be able to like use those resources even if you don't have them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sure listening to Musa and Luwal, you will agree with me that it's worth the effort investing in young people anyway. And to, and to any other young person who might be listening and you're in this room or you're watching online and you think that, oh, maybe they're speaking like that because they are at an advantage stage or they are in Washington, D.C., so they have not had to face struggles. Luau has had to navigate the barriers of working through a refugee camp. And he still made it and he is transforming the role of young people, not just, that look, not just the young people that look like Africans, but any young person who can look at Luau and listen to his story will be inspired. Musa, on the other hand. Mm, <laughs> Musa, on the other hand, being very modest about his successes as well, he has advised presidents he has navigated the challenges of struggles in Mali. And if you've read about Mali, you know the struggles that are there. And these, this is what is a resilient young person looks like, a resilient young person who chooses to not look at the barriers that they have. The one speaking with you has had to navigate so many barriers coming from Zimbabwe and finding herself even in Washington, D.C. on this platform. And I've learned to honor the platforms that are given to us as young people, and which is why I asked that question as well, that what are you doing to honor the spaces that are given to you? What are you doing to honor the platforms that are given to you? I honor the Atlantic Council for making this possible. I honor DAI for making it possible to invest in young people in sessions like these ones. And we need more of these. We need collaboration, we need intervention, and we need spaces like this beyond this platform because there are many other Luwals out there whose stories you've not heard. There are many other Musas who are probably presidents in waiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we want those stories to be told, but how can those stories be told without the support of your mentorship? without the support of the programs that are available through the governments, through the foundations, through the private sector. So we want to thank you for even taking your time. You could have gone to any other session, but we want to thank you for making time to just listen to these inspiring stories. And there is more. And when you rally behind young people, truly we can, ident we can find prosperity in our economies. We can find true development internationally, and we can really nature the leaders that should be natured to move the story of the African youth forward. And what a beauty when they collaborate with the developing countries that are investing in them. So thank you, even for taking the time to listen to us today. And with that, we have three minutes. If you have any questions, comments for Luau and Musa. Hey everybody again. <laughs> Auntie, I'm waiting for my flight. It's <laughs> <laughs> booked. Uh, but no, um, I just want to say this is an amazing panel. As someone um, who is a member of the diaspora, my parents are from um, Senegal and Guinea, and my parents have never had a chance at an education. Um, so now they have a son working on the highest levels of government in the nation's capital. So um, it's inspiring, you know, what people can do. And for me, it was just having hope and just um, being hungry and um, looking at chances of exposure. And for me, like, for people of the diaspora that are here, we can use our privilege to, you know, travel back and forth. And, you know, for me, I love traveling, so for, I'm gonna have more of a conscious <laughs> effort to travel back home um, and, you know, do things that spur the economy back home and, like, like let my other friends do the same thing. So um, it's a very awesome panel, and this was a very good. So thank you for having us. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.
so much. Any questions or contributions, please? Yes, sir. Final words? Uh, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Uh, Dan Langford from DAI. Um, thanks for the great, great discussion. Um, Musa, your description of um, political engagement in Mali uh, reminded me in particular of an sort of unexpected interview I had um, with another uh, Malian young man. Um, and his analysis was essentially that um, the older generation um, in Mali and, and uh, other Sahelian countries had become very cynical um, and disengaged. Um, and that the youth of, of your country were certainly not naive. <laughs> you saw the political corruption. Um, you saw the environmental degradation, the you know, ongoing exploitative you know, neo-colonial economic patterns. Um, but you remained hopeful and continued to engage. So my question for all three of you um, is what do the Atlantic Council, DAI, the donors that fund us do, uh, you know, what do we do that we shouldn't, con we should do less of <laughs> and not continue doing um, to prevent your generation from following that path into cynicism? And what could we do more of? Mm. Mm. Okay, we have one hundred and f one minute and fifty five seconds. Okay, I don't know how you're going to do it, but good question. Uh, thank you. This is a great <laughs> comment, and thanks so much, uh, Mr. Diallo, for your. So we hope to see you back in the home zone. Mm -hmm. So about your point, uh, the former president of Nigeria, Olusegun Obasanjo, used to say, "They will never give you the space. No one will open the door of power and mm -hmm. ask you to come in. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to go and get it." So we may have excuses. Sorry, I don't know the interview with the, the person. We may, in Mali, if we wanted tons of excuses every day, we will have it. And the very relevant ones. But we have to decide if we stop because of this or we continue to move. Mm -hmm. I'm a very solution-oriented person. I'm not saying there is no problems around me every day. When we talk about corruption, when some will talk about the corruption in Washington, D.C., it will say it's the most, city, the most corrupted city in the world. Some may say this, right? But we don't have the same level or the same context. But if you decide to show the positive way, you will move through this positive way. And myself and my organization and people around me, we worked much more around the, the constructive and solution-driven approach. And about what you can do, this is a very good question. She mentioned this kind of platforms. And she said, I personally know tons of people who are smarter than me in Mali, people more active than me in Mali, why they are not here. So this is how we can open doors. I'm here today. Whatever I can take back home, for sure I will take back. And whoever I can connect in Mali, I will connect. I'm, as I said, Leo was just an example. So what you can do more is how you can, excuse me, I know the time is, <laughs> this is a very important point. Mm. So investing in civil society, today is very critical. The political space in Mali is very critical. We have to be very careful about what we say. And she said, I advise the government, but I had to resign. Because when your principles and everything is engaged, you have to make a choice. Maybe some did not, I, I didn't mention it, but I resigned. So there is a lot of pressure on people who dare stand and speak, and especially speak about politics, right? So we have to make choice. So your support and feeling part of this network is more than encouraging and is more than empowering for me personally, returning back home and keep pushing hard. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, this is just evidence that we need more of these platforms because we could not even answer all the questions that we yeah. had. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we want to honor you for taking time to be with us. We thank you, DAI. We thank you, Atlantic Council. And we thank you, our panel. We thank you, all of you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Matendo. Thank you.